Okay, um, welcome to, to everybody. Uh, I'm Daniele Varzano from the CNR uh, Italian Research Council and the Institute of Nanoscience. And I'm also the coordinator of the training activities uh, of the MAX uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, it's a pleasure today to introduce uh, uh, this webinar. This webinar will focus on the capability and features of the Yambo code. Uh, tool for excited states calculations uh, and uh, with a particular focus uh, on uh, uh, quasi-particle band structures and uh, uh, excitons in, uh, in novel materials. This, uh, this webinar is, uh, is the first webinar of a series uh, of uh, the Max Center of, of Excellence uh, aimed uh, to uh, show the most recent developments uh, on the Max uh, flagship uh, codes. Uh, a suite of codes uh, based on first principle calculation for material science. We had in the past uh, already two webinars, uh, one on Quantum Espresso and one on the AIDA platform, and uh, we have already scheduled other two webinars. Uh, uh, one next week, it's uh, uh, about HPC libraries uh, for the CP2K code and other electronic structure codes. And in September, we will have uh, uh, another webinar uh, on the de new developments uh, in siestas for high performance computer simulations. Uh, if you missed uh, uh, the previous webinars uh, in the Max Webinars webpage, uh, uh, you can find uh, uh, the slides uh, uh, as well as the video recording on the past webinar. In the same webpage, you can have updates and subscribe to the forthcoming uh, uh, webinars. Uh, well, just a few words uh, about uh, a, key, a key focus uh, in Max, among other tasks, uh, there is a, a, a lot of work in software architectures toward exascales, uh, performance uh, portability in uh, hybrid uh, architectures and machines, uh, code evolution, uh, aiming uh, to, uh, to drive uh, our codes to exascales, and uh, for of you uh, that already have some uh, um, already have some experience, uh, you know the excited states calculations uh, as done by Yambo are uh, pretty much uh, more computational expense expensive than ground state calculations. So arriving to the extra scale traditions with uh, uh, performance code, that this will allow uh, uh, great benefits. Uh, uh, just for instance, affordability of uh, larger systems, uh, much more, more than we can calculate now, but also very importantly, also to have a better precision, because uh, if you already did uh, some uh, GW calculation, you know that uh, uh, the issue of the convergence is, is uh, uh, quite uh, um, important. So uh, now the uh, webinar of today is focused on the Yambo code. It's a Fortran code that, that uh, implements mainly many body perturbation theory, such as GW and beta separator equation, TDFT. Uh, so you can calculate essentially um, light matter interactions, uh, calculate uh, fundamental properties uh, as band structure of semiconductors, band alignments, uh, uh, also non-linear phenomena, uh, optics and out of equilibrium phenomena. Uh, so you can have a direct comparison with experiments. Uh, so you can predict uh, and uh, the, the, the properties of new materials. Uh, you can provide interpretations uh, to experiments in different fields as a photovoltaic, photocatalysis, optoelectronics uh, and, uh, and so on. So the schedule of the webinar of today, the first contribution will be by Andrea Marini. Uh, that uh, will illustrate uh, briefly, we give uh, an introduction to the GOAD, uh, but also on the, let's say, Yambo ecosystem, so it's uh, educational and user supports. Will be followed by uh, Maurizia Palummo from the University of Tor Vergata that, uh, will, uh, that uh, she will uh, uh, give us uh, through a series of uh, uh, examples, uh, some uh, hints uh, and tips on how to perform uh, GW and beta salpeter uh, equations. We will have a contribution uh, of uh, Dr. Mirta Gruning from Queen's University of Belfast uh, that uh, will illustrate us uh, some new feature features of the Yambo code uh, based on real-time simulation, so that allow us to go beyond the linear uh, regime. And finally, uh, Andrea Ferretti from CNR Nano uh, will uh, um, 
give us an excursus on the Yamboata HPC in, in high performance computing. So how to run uh, Yambo, how run Yambo performs uh, in uh, in uh, uh, HPC centers, in particular with a focus on the, his uh, uh, GPU that uh, has been recently uh, the code has been uh, recently uh, ported. Well, uh, I stop here. Uh, just a few recommendations. So there, there is a, a question answer bottom where you can uh, post there your questions during the webinar. We will try to answer uh, some of the questions so will be, if there is time, also addressed live by the, by the speakers. And uh, uh, there, will, there will be also some instantaneous pool uh, that uh, help us to have some uh, uh, feedback uh, from the audience. So I don't want to take uh, uh, more time here. So I, um, I leave the floor to Andrea Marini uh, that will uh, give us uh, the, um, the introduction to the Yambo code. Andrea Marini from its uh, uh, a senior researcher at the CNR in Italy, in Rome, at the Instituto of Matter, and uh, importantly is, let's say, the, the pioneer of the Yambo code and uh, 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 he will uh, uh, is, is the is the right person to introduce the code. So Andrea, the floor is yours. Here I am. Okay, I will share the screen. And where is it? Uh, yes. Give me a second. Share the screen. Okay. Yeah, to share. Yes. Okay, so I yeah, am. My name is Andrea Marini. I'm actually a yes, pioneer and founder of the code. Actually, um, I, I was, will tell you shortly this, the, the, the project started during my PhD. So um, during this 10 minutes introduction, I will just describe what is the perspective of a code like Yambo in the material science world. And um, then I will introduce shortly what well, is the, the story of Yambo, super short introduction, even if it's 20 years long, so there will be, there should be many things to talk about. Then I will actually try to convince you that these modern codes are actually bridges between theories and technological development or high performance computing. So they are sort of big bridges that just make those two different words to meet and work to produce uh, material science calculations. And then I will end with an important, very important aspect that is the um, philosophy behind Yambo. I mean, what you should know before running and using it. So in the material science world, it's a huge world that, get, that, that got increasing in size along the years. So of course you're interested in applications. I'm pretty sure that most of you would like to calculate, use Yambo or the other max codes to produce numbers and then produce publications. But of course applications require some principle to apply that can be density functional theory or GW, Peter, whatever, you name it. So you need first to understand for your application which kind of physics you need and then you will have to do the actual calculation. At the beginning, this was not the most important part of the story. The most important was the application and the theory. But along the years, the computational part increased in importance and size. So this uh, was fooled by the development of new computers, new power computers, and then GPU, CPU, supercomputers. Uh, at the time, Yambo was the first time coded that there were no uh, supercomputers, just clutter, clusters connected through standard Ethernet connection. And then this increase in size of the computational aspect of the whole story comes around with two important uh, uh, words that at the beginning were in no contact with the, with the physics. That is computer science and computer engineering. And this is becoming more and more important. And this is the reason why there is max. But let's start from the, the left part of our screen, from physics. Because at the end, at the beginning actually, you need to understand which kind of physics you need to apply. And then 
of course, the word of theoretical physics in general or methodology is very huge. So it depends on what you want to calculate. And this is the first question you should do yourself. So what do I need? I need to calculate gaps. So maybe DFT or TDFT are enough, or maybe not. But then you see that starting from the bottom of the approximations, the more complex applications are like uh, steps in a stair that brings eventually to heaven. So you have then more complicated NDFTs, many body perturbation theory, and there you can access to objects that are not available in DFT, like I don't know, in this case, our bands or the, 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 the plot here on the right is an exidon uh, wave function uh, distribution. But then you can even go up and up in the, in the, in the, in the stairs where you can think, okay, now I want to go in systems that are not actually in the equilibrium, fully correlated, but not in equilibrium, but actually taken out of equilibrium from, because of pump pulses or excitations, strong excitations. And there, neither DFT nor many body are enough. We have to use even more complex method like non-equilibrium Green's function approach. Then Yambo is a code that embodies pieces of these different theories, and it can give you access, access to different observables depending on the theory you are applying. Super short story about Yambo. Originally, it was not named Yambo, it was named Self. Uh, it was done by me at the beginning because I needed a GW code for medals and there were no codes for medals. So I wrote my, my code and then I finished my PhD. But then the, I used Yambo to produce other observables. I decided to continue my research using Yambo as a tool, as a pencil, you know? It, with a pencil, you can draw theories and with a code, you can do calculations. And so this is what happened in reality. Uh, more pieces, more theories and more applications were done. And then these this pieces of new code actually were maintained carefully inside the code. So that the code grew in size in 2008, it turned GPL, so for eight years it was no GPL. It turned GPL, and the original paper is was published and signed by four of us. Three of us are in this webinar: me, Mirta, and Daniele. Here, Daniele is super young. Also, me, I'm okay. It's always beautiful, and and also Mirta. And uh, then after the open source, the the development continued. And then we had electron fauna, neutral solvers, magnetic properties, total energy, collinear and non-collinear support, and then several versions. Now we are at version 4.5. Okay, the number of developers, and then the size actually of, of the code. Well, it's enough to have a few numbers to get a feeling of the size of the project. Originally, in the original paper, we had four authors. In the last paper we did last year, we had 20. So we moved for four, from four to 20. And uh, among those 20, there are the original developers, among many, many more uh, uh, entered the development. We have, uh, the code is hosted on a JIT uh, repository, on GTAB, and there are 50 development branches. So this means there are 50 copies of the code where development of specific, specific features are done. So from this, you can get a feeling of how large is the development of the code. We have a forum, a wiki page that I will describe shortly, tutorials online. We do schools. We did several schools. We managed to have a, a big school every two years, but also other satellite schools have been done. Yambo has traveled practically all over the world from South Africa, so sorry, from Africa, yes, South Africa, Africa, Ghana, and, and many other uh, places in, in Africa, America, South America, North America, China, Japan. So it, it really traveled a lot in, and we gave lectures and schools to many, many, I, I think that we, didn't, we never actually calculated the exact number of students, but really, really many. The last one was in, in ICTP uh, this January, last January. Then we have uh, an enormous part of the code connected to the max development that is for performance. So for example, at the moment, and there would be the, the talk of Andrea uh, Ferretti, Yambo is able to run on uh, GPU uh, processors, so on video cards. 
And this is really the front end of APC, uh, high performance uh, computing services. So in addition to, 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 to more uh, standard CPUs, also now GPUs can be used. And the code is able to run on thousands and thousands of cores and also to, in this way, uh, be able to simulate very large systems. So the size of the system actually are increasing uh, at the same speed of the development of the code. And actually, at the moment, Andrea will tell you, it's even sometimes difficult to reach the saturation of the performance. Okay, let me uh, use the last two minutes to, 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 to introduce about the, the philosophy. Because of course, any of you could say, oh wow, this is a marvelous tool and I would like to use it today, also tomorrow. And you can do it because you can go on the web page, download it, compile it, and then run it. But the point is that, that if you don't study before, you most probably will produce mostly garbage. So why is this? Because Yambo is a complex project and actually the complexity of the code is just reflecting the complexity of the problem. So in general, you can simplify the whole procedure in four different steps. That is the physical phenomenon you want to describe, the theory and methods you want to use, and also how do I implement this theory in my specific case? And then how, we do, how, do, how do I run? How do I do the simulation? Because in general, any input file of Yambo has hundreds of parameters. And it's really, uh, you need knowledge to understand exactly how to change them, how to tune them. So first of all, before running the code, go on the wiki. You see the web, by, web page there. And there you will find tutorials and also descriptions about the general theory. So first, you need to understand, to study physics, to understand which kind of physics I need to describe and which kind of theory I need to apply. Is this, this theory coded in Yambo? So if you want to calculate upper bands, you cannot use Yambo, forget it. Yambo is GW, not the physics of upper bands. This is an example. Then you need to use the tutorials that are on the wiki web page to actually run Yambo in a controlled way, in a driven way, where you are guided in the choice of the parameters and in the selection of the specific method to run Yambo, so in parallel with GPUs or whatever. The last thing is, if you need help, there is a forum, dedicated forum, just go there and post your question. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. So I think there are five minutes for questions. How do we do it? Yes. Um... Yes, we have a few minutes uh, for the questions. And uh, I mean, we have questions uh, by, um, by um, Manuel Hussein. Uh, he said, very, when you mentioned very large system, the question is how many electrons in general can be treated? Not easy to answer, but uh, Andrea, please. Oh yeah, of course, this depends on, well, I mean, Mona, Mona, Manor, yes, you first should tell, tell us which kind of atoms, because of course, if you want to calculate a compound made of 100 silicon atoms, I would say, yes, you can do it. It also depends how, how much space, if it is nanostructure or solid, extended, or extended. Of course, if it is 100 atoms of palladium or rhodium, well, of course, it's heavier, and because Yambo is a plane wave code. So in any case, you need to describe your system in terms of plane waves. So if you need, so if you have a lot of space or a lot of you know, oscillations and, and, and variations of density in your system, that could be in a heavy atom, then you need a lot of plane waves. I hope this answers your question. Oh, okay. Uh, if we have time for another question, maybe. Uh... Oh, the reason is, uh, can you briefly go for Yambo with other codes, Berkeley GW? Well, yeah. I, can't, I can't, you must. Just okay, the uh, um, there, is, a, there yeah. is a recent paper on uh, this topic uh, on computer physics communication where uh, um, three codes, uh, mainly Yambo, the Berkeley GW, and the Binitz, uh, 
were compared uh, when calculating uh, uh, gaps in bulk systems. And then we can provide later maybe the, the reference on that. But in any case, all of you, it's Yambo is not the only GW code in the market. Just try them and find the one that most fits your abilities. Because it's like, you know, it's exactly like a pencil. You have to find a pencil that you are more, I mean, able to use, that is more friendly, that you like the most. And then you would be more productive. Okay, I think that uh, uh, we can uh, go to the next uh, uh, speaker. If there will be time, we will answer some of the questions arriving uh, uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Maurizia Palummo. She is an associate professor at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Uh, she works at the Institute of Physics uh, uh, in the Condensed Matter Theory Group. And, uh, um, she will uh, show us uh, some uh, hints and tips uh, through some uh, examples uh, for calculation of quasi-particle and excitons uh, uh, using Yambo. Thank you, Maritz. Hi. Hi. Do, you, do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so thank you, Daniele, for the introduction. I'm sorry, because I have a problem. I have to go to the first slide, and then I can start. Okay. So here we are. Thank you, Daniele, for the introduction, and thank you to all of you for participating to this webinar. After the historical introduction given by Andrea about the code, uh, my talk is uh, more devoted to show you which are the implemented equation. In particular, I, I will focus on the calculation of quasi-particle energy and exciton, so the GW method and the beta Peter equation. And then I will try to give you some example of the research that you can done. So I will uh, speak about some recent work I've done using Yambo. But before doing that, uh, since I didn't know exactly the kind of audience, uh, I want to give you again uh, some motivation of using Yambo and also uh, read a few words about the theoretical framework we are speaking about, that is density functional theory and post-DFT, in particular many body perturbation theory. So the general motivation actually has been already mentioned by Daniele and Andrea, but is very simple in the sense that in many fields of physics and condensed matter physics and material science, like for instance, optoelectronics, photovoltaics or photocatalysis, probably you need, you need to interpret the spectroscopic data from experiment, you need to find key parameters to improve, for instance, devices, or uh, with without uh, doing a trial and error uh, approach uh, often used in the experiment uh, or simply predict the new excited state material properties. In this sense, uh, probably you need to describe not only ground state properties of a material, but also excited state properties like gap, band offset, optical spectra, and uh, very often uh, the dimensionality of the material is different. So you can be interested in nanostructure, in bulk, uh, in surfaces, uh, in nanowire, uh, uh, whatever you want. So in this sense, parameter-free quantum mechanical theory based on DFT and post-DFT method is very useful because how to give you a lot of liberty in simulation, but at some expenses from computational point of view, clearly with respect to empirical or semi-empirical model. Let me give you some brief, some, some brief um, introduction about DFT. As probably you remember, DFT is a very uh, useful tool uh, to describe uh, ground state properties of material, but generally uh, there, is, uh, there are some uh, shortcomings, like the fact that the gap, the electronic gap, are underestimated, the connection gap. And so uh, in this framework, uh, you have to move to a more refined theory, that is the many body perturbation theory or the green function approach, where when you introduce, uh, for instance, the single particle propagator, at the end it can be shown that uh, in order to obtain the quasi-particle, the real quasi-particle bus structure of material, what you have to do is to correct the Koenig-Sham 
um, energy with uh, this uh, uh, expression that if nothing else uh, that uh, the perturbative expression with respect to the exchange correlation functional in the new k quantity that is uh, the self energy operator that uh, diagrammatically is expressed as uh, the product of the w the screen at the coulomb potential and the green function in this way you are able uh, to um, compare with experiment like for instance uh, photon emission inverse photon emission arpes or scanning tunnel spectroscopy but another possibility is that maybe you are interested in describing optical properties and if you do this at the FT level or even at the quasi-particle level within the GW approach, you often are not able to reproduce the optical feature because what you are neglecting is actually the interaction between electron and hole in the system that are created when you have light that arrive in your system and the, the material absorb light. And so what we have to do is actually is uh, to describe a two particle green function that is called the beta salpeter equation that describe the interaction between the electron and hole. And in this way, what you have is that the absorption, for instance, is described as a mixing of single particle transition and the energy has not anymore the quasi-particle energy, what you can obtain in the previous step, but are actually the excitonic in values that you can obtain solving what is called an excitonic Hamiltonian that describe actually the electron hole couple. Uh, and in this way you are able to describe a lot of optical spectra. So now we can see what Yambo can do uh, more um, precisely. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the GW um, bus structure is calculated in a perturbative approach and uh, the most standard way to do it in Yambo is using uh, what is called uh, the um, Dyson solver N. Uh, there is a, a nice feature in Yambo that uh, actually uh, um, is able, you are able to um, uh, produce your input, but uh, you can see in the tutorial, I don't have time to discuss. In any case, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the self-energy is expanded linearly around the Konisham uh, eigenvalues, and in this way, you are able to calculate the new quasi-particle energy. In Yambo, differently from other code, the self-energy that is actually, as mentioned before, the G times W, is uh, separated in two parts. One is the exchange part of the self-energy that we call uh, sigma x, and the other one, this one, is the correlation part of the self-energy that is called here sigma g. Uh, the nice feature is that uh, in Yambo you can do this calculation uh, starting from uh, uh, what is called one shot GW, G0, W0 calculation, and uh, uh, using uh, in the, both in G and also in W the Konisham again values the game function. But also there is the possibility to do some self-consistent cycle uh, updating uh, in, in Yambo only the energy, both in G and in W or only in G. What is, uh, this is done activating these two variables in the input. Again, you can find tutorial online. The other uh, nice things that uh, I want to mention is that uh, um, in Yambo, uh, you can start uh, with the calculation done at the DFT level, for instance, uh, with the quantum express or, or a binit, uh, doing a calculation that are collinear, so no spin polarized or spin polarized, if, for instance, you are interested in magnetic system. But uh, you can also do calculation in a non-collinear framework. So, for instance, in system where the spin orbit uh, interaction is important. Another uh, thing that I want to mention is that you can start from any flavor of local or semi-local exchange and correlation functional, like LDA, GGA, uh, both from quantum espresso and the BINIT. And in the last uh, version of YAMBO, there is also the possibility to interface with hybrid exchange functional from quantum espresso. Uh, the exchange part uh, is, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to enter in the equation, but just to give you an idea, the exchange part of the self-energy is actually very fast because as you can see here, the sigma x is uh, formally a sum of only occupied state. There, there is an integration over Q point and the bz, and there is only a sum over g, only one g uh, space of the Coulomb uh, component. 
the correlation instead is much more time consuming and this is uh, the part that generally uh, is quite difficult uh, if your system is big so you can learn more in the last speech from Andrea Marini who will, who will give, give you a trick about how to use uh, the, paral the parallel uh, parallelization variable in Yambo. In any case as you can see already in a standard calculation there are some tricks that can be useful the first thing is that uh, the, um, since the correlation part requires in principle a, a full omega integration, generally in many, many systems uh, is enough to use a plasma pole model uh, that generally is good for all systems, not for metals, for instance, as uh, uh, Andrea Marini mentioned before. In that case, you, have to, you are obliged to use a, a more cumbersome calculation that is the full integration of omega prime. But there is also the nice uh, possibility to restart the calculation, uh, reading the uh, database of the, uh, the electric screening uh, in a previous uh, calculation. And also uh, recently it has been implemented um, the terminator in the sum of an unoccupied state that uh, as I'll show you later um, fa uh, make uh, the, um, the calculation much faster. And there is also the possibility to use a random integration and Coulomb cutoff. Regarding uh, the quasi-particle, uh, um, sorry, the, um, the excitonic calculation, the beta salpeter equation, as I mentioned before, is remapped in the solution of the excitonic Hamiltonian that, that is in this way. And uh, the excitonic Hamiltonian uh, can be uh, calculated in the full matrix, that is the so-called no tan dankov approximation. And generally, this kind of approach means that the matrix is not Hermitian and has four components, a resonant, anti-resonant, and two coupling part. And generally, this kind of calculation is important for molecular or energy loss spectra, while, uh, for instance, um, uh, when you are interested in optics, the tan tank of approximation, only these two parts of the equation are enough. Uh, again, you can do collinear and non-collinear calculation, the beta salpeter at Q equals zero, so for optics, and also Q uh, finite momentum exciton. So you can look, for instance, at the dispersion of the exciton for finite momentum. Regarding the, the spectra, uh, you can obtain both uh, the spectrum uh, formally connected to the diagonalization, to the inversion of this uh, um, expression of this uh, operator. You can obtain both from the diagonalization. In this case, uh, you can uh, look at the excitonic eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, from this equation and then analyze, the, for instance, the exciton, the oscillator strength, and other information, or you can invert directly this uh, uh, matrix, and this is done uh, through the LAPAC Scalapac library, also using a recursive approach like Lanzos uh, IDOC approach. So uh, now, uh, briefly, I want to show you some uh, system. For instance, the first one is a two-dimensional material, is a bilayer of boron nitride, as uh, probably many of you know, uh, is a material of interest in optoelectronics. And uh, in this case, we were interested to see how the, twist, uh, how the exciton and the structure change with twisting angle of uh, bilayer. And uh, to do that, we have to do uh, GW calculation beyond the G0W0. And this is, the, for instance, one of the systems that uh, we look at. Uh, you can see the difference. And uh, um, also, we have to do uh, beta salpeter for many, many structures. The bigger structure that we did is with 86 atom of boron and nitrogen with a twisting angle of 13 uh, degree. And this is the size of the matrix that we diagonalized. are not very big, but in any case, you can see that the IDOC solver is very, very much efficient. And uh, finally, uh, what we, have, we did is also to look at the uh, oscillator strength of uh, the hexiton. For instance, in this system, we discovered that, that uh, changing the staking and the more angle of the bilayer, you have uh, exciton that from dark become dry, bright, and also the spatial localization of the exciton change completely de depending from the orientation of the, the, the two angles. The, the last system that I want to show you, because probably I, I don't know, Daniele, how much time do I have? 
Uh, well, still five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I have time to show you another example. Uh, this is, a, a, again, a two-dimensional system that is not very big, only six atoms uh, for the unit cell, but it's quite interesting because it's a molybdenum disulfide in the tetragonal distorted phase. This material is interesting because uh, uh, together with other group six uh, transition metal decathcogenite, it has been recently proposed the, like a candidate for quantum spinol effect. And uh, the important thing is that this material is semi-metal when the, the uh, SOC interaction is turned off, while it becomes, uh, there is a small gap, uh, inversion gap, when the spin orbit is uh, uh, turned on, so it's quite important. And the question that we pose at the Howard said uh, regarding this material is there is uh, the possibility that this material become uh, an excitonic insulator, so there is the possibility to have an excitonic disability. And the answer is yes, in the and uh, I'll show you uh, in a minute that uh, in order to answer to this question, uh, we have to, uh, to perform a um, very converged uh, GW and beta Peter calculation. And the, what, our answer is that the excitonic band energy actually exceeds of 32 millibi the quasi-particle gap. So, uh, starting from this information, we collaborate with Max Rontani in Modena, who performed the mean fields and consistent gap equation model for this material, and uh, we were able to predict that this material actually can be a topological insulator material. But just to give you an idea, what we have to do to answer th this question was to do calculation at the GW and beta Peter level, including the uh, spin orbit interaction in all the level of the calculation. Use the Coulomb cutoff to eliminate the spurious interaction between the images, because uh, if not, the quasi-particle gap is uh, largely underestimated. Use the terminator to converge the empty state in the GW calculation, and also use very, very dense uh, K-mesh in the GW and beta salpeter to reach accuracy, accuracy of about 10 mV. And this is uh, just to give you an idea. On the, on the left, you see the calculation at GW done uh, in two different K-points uh, without the use of terminator. These are instead the, the use with terminator. You can see that at 300 bands is already converged. The wide here at 1,000, the, the convergence is not there. Uh, the other important point is that the use of the cutoff in the Coulomb potential allows to uh, obtain the quasi-particle gap that is much larger than what we have found in the literature, because in previous calculation uh, the cutoff was not included and the quasi-particle gap was an underestimated of about 0.2 eV. And the other uh, information here is that uh, we were able, uh, thanks to the parallelization, um, of, of the algorithm uh, to use a very dense uh, K-mesh. Uh, here we uh, reach the uh, convergence with uh, about uh, 800 K-points. Uh, and these are the timing uh, in Marconi Cento, for instance, for a one only uh, calculation of the, the electric matrix for one Q-point uh, in calculation and inversion. Uh, so I think that I have to skip the last two because probably I don't have time. Uh, but uh, um, just to give you another example, uh, also system uh, again with spin orbit uh, that can be interested uh, probably for some of us uh, that are um, hybrid perovskite, layered perovskite, are affordable. Clearly, in this case, uh, you, you must have a super a high performance supercomputer to do the calculation, but uh, you can give uh, some estimation. For instance, uh, this is a work that we have done uh, two years ago where we were able to reproduce uh, the optical excitonic feature compared with the experimental data of this uh, transition or of this uh, perovskite. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Maurizia. Uh, maybe we have time uh, for a um, for the short questions, uh, it seems that there are many people interested in uh, uh, 2D materials, uh, layered materials. Uh, we have receiving many questions. I think uh, uh, this one by Shivani Saini can be of interest for many of the attendees. And uh, the question is uh, uh, how we can study with the AMBO excitonic behavior in Van der Waals uh, heterostructure? What we should uh, care about uh, to have uh, a good description of the excitons in uh, Van der Waals heterostructures. 
Okay, uh, so um, I, I have to say that uh, it's really important to describe, to introduce in some way the van der Waals inter um, interruption at the DFT level. This gives you the correct structure from geometrical point of view. And then uh, starting from that, uh, you can do self-consistent calculation turning off uh, the van der Waals interaction, uh, so using simple uh, PBE functional. And then from that, uh, you can do the calculation uh, without the inclusion of the van der Waals, uh, because uh, I mean, the really the, the important thing is that you have the, the proper and right geometry of the material. <clears throat> okay. Uh... So, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, go ahead with, uh, with the next contribution. Uh, it is uh, by uh, speaker will be uh, Mirta Gruding. Uh, Mirta is a senior lecturer at the School of Mathematics and Physics at the Queen's University of uh, Belfast. And uh, she will uh, uh, talk about uh, the real-time implementation in, uh, in the YAMBO code and uh, about the description on nonlinear optics in, in YAMBO. That's something that also has been uh, um, asked uh, in the question answer box. And, uh, okay, thank you, Mirta. And, uh, uh, thank you, Daniele. Um, so let me start from 2009. So this is when the YAMBO code was released and the paper was published. And there were two main features, the GW approximation for quasi-particle uh, correction and the beta salpeter equation for optical absorption spectra. So very much what has been covered by Maurizia. Of course, at the time we were limited by small systems and nowadays, thanks also to the participation to the Max Center of Excellence, YAMBO can be used uh, for much larger systems. So this was shows, shown by Maurizia and Andrea Ferretti will give other example. Let's go back to 2009. Um, we also had the ambition of extending these two approaches, GW and Beta Salpeter, to other regimes for other spectroscopies. So to the nonlinear regimes, so to nonlinear optics, such as second harmonic generation, and this will be what is covered by this presentation, but also to out of equilibrium regime, so extreme nonlinear optics, such as high harmonic generation or pump probe. And this will not be covered, but it is uh, uh, an area of intense development in Yambu. 10 years ago, this was very much an uncharted territory for ab initio based uh, on many body perturbation theory. There were few isolated works, but there were no tools available to the community. And this is far from surprising considering the challenges, the dragons. So what are those challenges? What are those dragons? So here are a few examples only. So in the case of nonlinear optics, for example, if we want to do better salpeter in the response theory, we need to, high, to add high order electron hole diagrams. And these proved to be cumbersome already at the second order. For extreme nonlinear optics, the energy which is associated with laser is as large as some quantity in the system. For example, for high harmonic generation, it is of the same order of magnitude of the band gap. So we cannot use perturbative approaches. On top of that, when we look at pump probe experiment, we need to include the relevant scattering processes. And we want to do this also at an ab initio level. And this proved to be very challenging as well. So the first step that uh, we took in surmounting these challenges was to shift from response theory to real time. So real time is the natural framework to treat excited carriers dynamics and it allows to treat linear, nonlinear, extreme nonlinear at the same level. But then the question was still, how can we bring the successful recipe of GW plus Beta Salpeter into a real time framework? So let's first take a step back and look at the ingredients of this successful recipe. 
So first of all, we use the Consham energies and block functions. So this gives us an ab initio theory. So no ad hoc parameters. Then second, we need to correct the Consham energies to get quasi-particle energies using the GW approximation. Finally, we include excitonic effect using the coulomb screen exchange approximation for the kernel in the Bethel-Salpeter equation. And critically, this is a static approximation, which makes the calculation much simpler, but still is accurate enough to describe excitons in most systems. So what we proposed was to swap this uh, uh, many body perturbation theory workhorse that uh, it's fine in uh, linear response and e equilibrium with the flying horse of non-equilibrium Green's function, but still retain the same approximations and the same ingredients that we used for the GW plus beta Salpeter. So uh, we get to this equation of motion for the lesser Green's function uh, reduced to one time. If you're not familiar with non-equilibrium Green's function, uh, this is actually trivially proportional to the density matrix, which you may be familiar with. So as I said, the ingredients will be the uh, Consham uh, Hamiltonian and uh, uh, cor quasi-particle corrections. So this you obtain by a density function plus GW approximation uh, calculation beforehand. And then there are the Hartree uh, potential and the uh, um, self energy. And finally, this U is the interaction with the external field. We are working in the dipole approximation. So you need to input just the intensity and the time dependence. Once you integrate this equation of motion, you obtain information on the coherent response of the system. So on the polarization or the uh, current and also on the ex uh, excited carrier dynamics. Um, so in this presentation, I focus on the coherent response and here we still have a challenge. So how to calculate the bulk polarization. So the problem, I cannot be just uh, too long on this, is that the density is not enough to calculate bulk polarization. And in fact, it is defined as a battery phase. So if this battery phase is a purely many body um, quantity, but if we manage to um, approximate the many body wave function with the Slater determinant, and this is possible within the Coulomb screen exchange approximation, we are also, we are able to just uh, reduce to this expression, the only needs occupied uh, block states to calculate the polarization. So this is static polarization, we need dynamic polarization. And for that, we followed the, this work of Sosa, Iniguez and Vanderbilt. And we transform our equation of motion to an equation of motion for the block states that at each uh, time diagonalized the Green's function. So then we just can rewrite the uh, polarization as a battery phase as it shows in this uh, equation. So uh, back to Yambo. Yambo contains both this equation of motions in two different branches. Both are available in the GPL. So the first uh, equation of motion based on Green's function is appropriate if you want to study excited state, uh, excited carrier dynamics. Uh, the second one, which will be the object of the rest of this presentation, is based on uh, block states and is appropriate to study the coherent response of the system, such as nonlinear uh, optical properties. How it works. So it works very much like an experimental setup. 
So if you want to choose an experiment, you actually choose the time dependent electric field and the post processing of the signal of the polarization. Just give an example. You give a delta kick and then you Fourier transform the polarization. So if this delta kick is small in, and in intensity, you get the linear response limit. So for example, the optical absorption. And here for uh, hexagonal boronitride, we uh, compare the actual linear response with this uh, uh, real time in the um, linear response limit, and we obtain exactly numerically the same results. We can also do uh, harmonic generation. So this is a, a sketch of an experiment. We shine light at uh, omega, and then we look at the response at two omega, three omega, and so on. Within Yambo, we do uh, exactly or similar. Um, we just uh, look at uh, a mono, we just give as input a monochromatic uh, um, field, and then the polarization will be the sum over all harmonics. We truncate this sum, we invert this expression, and then we renormalize by the field intensity to get the harmonic response. We can also look at experiments in which you change the intensity and you see how the response changes. So experimentally, this can be realized by putting a lens to focus the beam and then just move slightly the sample in the focus beam region so that it experiences different intensity and then detect the change in the response. The code works mostly very similarly. Again, we just uh, uh, give a monochromatic uh, field as an input. We perform the same analysis I outlined before and we extract the response at the frequency of the laser. Then we repeat this at different uh, field intensity and this allow us to extrapolate the third order um, response at the laser frequency, which is related, related for example, to two photon absorptions, absorption. So some example of approximation, uh, sorry, <laughs> of applications. Um, here we looked at uh, um, the um, second harmonic generation in uh, uh, monolayer carcogenides and clarify how strong is the second harmonic signal. This is another work on third harmonic in graphene, nanoribbons and nanotubes. And this is another example of two photon absorption in the hexagonal boron nitride comparing the bulk with the monolayer. So besides choosing the experiment, you also can choose the level of theory. Uh, I've shown result in the GW plus beta salpeter, but uh, by changing the effective Hamiltonian, you can change the level of theory. So this is exemplified in this uh, um, work. So for the a monolayer of hexagonal boronite, right, looking at the second harmonic generation, which is the top panel. So if you choose just uh, the Hamiltonian uh, at zero field, you obtain the independent Konsham uh, particle spectra. Then you can add the change of the Hartree potential, which is this green steeped light, and you add in this way crystal local effects. You can also add quasi particles. So you have quasi particle, uh, independent quasi particle spectra. And you see that in this case, it's not a trivial shift like in linear response. Finally, this is the full Hamiltonian that, uh, and you can just uh, compare this with the independent particle case and see that there are um, excitonic resonance at one and two photons. Finally, of course, you can also choose uh, 
DFT uh, effective Hamiltonian, so you can do real-time time-dependent density functional. So this is uh, done here for uh, gallium arsenide bulk and uh, looking at uh, second harmonic generation. And also in Yambo, we have implemented uh, um, some simple approximation for the macroscopic exchange and correlation field that uh, account uh, cheaply, uh, but reasonably accurately for uh, excitonic effect. So I want to conclude by thanking my uh, you for your attention and acknowledge my co-workers, in particular, Claudia Taccalite and Andrea Marini. Also, I want to thank uh, Davide Sangalli, Elena Cannuccia and Maurizio Palummo that contributed to uh, works I've shown. And of course, the rest of the Yambo team for the support and the Max Center for uh, the opportunity of presenting this work. Thank you very much, uh, Mirta. Uh, so we are receiving many, many questions here. Uh, here, we don't have uh, actually much questions on the nonlinear optic. This is a new part of the code, so I can imagine that it is not uh, yet a very well uh, used. Anyway, there is a question about the calculation of a second harmonic generation in presence of magnetic fields. Well, this, this is a, a good question. Um, so it depends. So if the the magnet, if you have a fixed magnetic field, you can perform a ground state calculation with the magnetic field, and then uh, this will, of course, just uh, and then just uh, perform, I guess, a time dependent. But uh, we don't have experimented with that, so this is just uh, on top of my head. Uh, but it's a very good question because, of course, the magnetic field will just break some of the um, symmetry of the system and so allow for uh, second harmonic uh, generation where maybe it's not. So, um, but yeah, so that's, I, I did never try it, but so that would be my, my suggestion. Okay, thank you, Mirta. And uh, I think uh, we can go on with the last speaker of this uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. Andrea Ferretti is a senior research at the Italian Research Council, uh, CNR, Institute of Nanoscience in Modena. Uh, the topic of his presentation is uh, uh, YAMBO at high performance computing, running YAMBO in parallel with a particular focus on the recent uh, uh, implementation of the GPU uh, support. Um, thank you, Andrea, okay. please. The floor is yours. Thanks, Daniele. Do you, he do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, do you also see my slides? Yes. Very well. Thanks a lot. So yeah, this talk is uh, going to discuss basically how to use YAMBO on uh, current uh, high performance computing machine with special attentions on uh, GPU. This is, uh, as Daniel said, Andrea Ferretti from CNR Nano. And uh, I'd like to start by reminding myself and everyone basically that as electronic structure partition, uh, practitioners, basically we are already using uh, quite a large amount of computational resources already at the DFT level. And then when we come to many body perturbation theory, basically we are climbing an hierarchy of methods and these methods are uh, ways more uh, 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 complicated to run on uh, um, computational machines. So here we use even more computational uh, power. And so this is one fact. And then the other fact uh, uh, that uh, I'd like to uh, point out is that, uh, as, as you know, and there's no need to, to remind this here in this context, uh, basically we are undergoing in terms of technology what is called the exascale transition that is uh, uh, we are um, inside basically of uh, machines that are able to perform 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. The first one in the US is expected for 2021 
and then in meantime in Europe we are expecting some pre-exascale machines and uh, uh, in a two more years also exascale machines are going to be available in Europe and then China and Japan. So these machines are basically already here. What is important to, uh, to note anyway is that uh, the technology, the stepping technology is going to be uh, disrupted, uh, disrupted steps. So technology is going to be disrupted, meaning that, uh, uh, and that is already there, we'll see um, for instance, a lot of accelerated machines. So uh, we, we won't have uh, simple GPU enabled machines, but most of uh, actually all the three big machines expected in the US are going to be GPU accelerators, accelerated. Also, this comes with some um, extra complexity that is we are going to see Three, dif uh, three different technologies, at least with three different software stacks, programming models and languages and so on. But this uh, is more a topic for developers. I'll keep this uh, aside for the moment. Nevertheless, all the methodologies uh, we've been discussing during this, uh, during this webinar need quite a lot of resources and they need to run as of today when tackling large scale systems on these big machines. So it, it is definitely important to know how many body perturbation theory can fit on uh, these accelerated machines. And also basically tomorrow, uh, these technologies uh, are going to be part of our commodity clusters at our universities uh, and so on. So it, it's a, a definitely relevant topic. And during this webinar, I'd like then to discuss what are the main strategies uh, that uh, we've used to port uh, uh, many, many body perturbation theory? Let's just take GW on GPUs and the experience we made with the uh, Yambo code on these machines. Uh, uh, I will also report some technical details for reference, how to compile, how to run on, uh, on these machines. And eventually I'll, uh, uh, as a take home message, try to rationalize the experience we made so, so far. So let me start by setting the stage uh, and discussing uh, or defining uh, what we mean by heterogeneous and homogeneous architecture. Homogeneous architectures, uh, HPC wise, basically means the clusters we are used to run on. So a collection of nodes, all pretty much identical, typically equipped with some uh, high bandwidth uh, network and the standard way our codes used to run on these machines is just to exploit the MPI library and uh, OpenMP. So with a combination of MPI and OpenMP, we can exploit these machines. Then heterogeneous architectures instead are a collection of nodes uh, that are connected then to one or easily more accelerator devices like uh, GPUs. And uh, uh, it's, import it's important to keep in mind that these devices are kind of vertical hardware. So, so they are not general purpose as uh, the host CPUs, as the, the, the standard processor that can host a, an operating system, perform IO operations, uh, go to the web, and so on. These devices are just there to uh, do number crunching. So they cannot host the operating, uh, operative uh, system cannot do IO and, uh, and so on. And uh, typically they are uh, capable of a large uh, amount of uh, computation. So they can do really a lot of number crunching. And uh, as of today, they are equipped with large, but still not huge uh, memory. So we need uh, typically uh, state of the art cards today have 16 gigabyte uh, um, run memory per card. So we need to keep an eye on it, especially when running the perturbation theory. And uh, so importantly, while for uh, homogeneous architecture, we, we're just relying on MPI and OpenMP, here we also need a library and somehow a language to just communicate with the devices. Uh, and this is uh, vendor dependent for the case of NVIDIA GPUs, that is what I'm going to discuss during this webinar. Uh, uh, the language and the library is CUDA. Uh, we'll also have uh, ROCAM or 1API for AMD and Intel uh, cards to come. 
Okay, so what about YAMBA on GPUs? For what I'm going to discuss, I'll consider standard GW um, canonical implementation that scales as n to the fourth power of the system dimension and uh, the related BSC algorithm. Uh, and of course, YAMBA is a plane waves and pseudo potential implementation of many body perturbation theory. Just let me remind what we need to do in order to exploit the GPUs. First, uh, we need to represent the data, meaning that uh, uh, we know how to represent data on the host, but we also need to represent data on the device. We need to handle data transfer. This is typically one of the most critical aspects of the uh, computation of GPUs on GPUs. And, uh, then we need to be able to perform computation on the device. For what concerns NVIDIA GPUs, uh, we have adopted the CUDA Fortran extension and, uh, and of course CUDA optimized libraries like CUDA Blast, QSolver and QFFT. As I already mentioned that this is very important, let me uh, uh, remind this again, it's important to keep an eye on the memory footprint. Also because typically uh, we run with the one MPI task per card and already out of it we are, have access to a large amount of uh, compute power and this means that uh, if with few MPIs we have a lot of compute power, memory is not going to be distributed as much as it used to be when running on many core machines where we had tens of thousands of MPIs. Here we are more when running a super large system on a few tens or hundreds of MPIs. So the memory uh, usage of each MPI task is quite large. So here is the typical uh, flow of uh, uh, Yambo when running on uh, GPUs. First, uh, some quantities are read on the host from databases from the disk, like wave functions, but could also be other YAMBO databases. Then these data, again, wave functions or similar quantities are transferred to the device. There, uh, heavy computation happens, and ideally even a reduction of the data, meaning, uh, I don't know, you can put two wave functions and do the scalar product on the device and get back just uh, the number, the scalar that is the scalar product. This is similar to what happens when we compute quasi-particle corrections. We uh, transfer to the device uh, a large amount of data wave functions and screening and we just get back a few numbers that are the quasi-particle correction. That is ideal. And then again back to the, to the from device to host and uh, down to disk. Importantly, uh, watch out for distributed linear algebra on GPUs. This is still a part of the software stack that is basically uh, missing around. Uh, NVIDIA is working on it. We'll take advantage of, on, uh, of it as soon as uh, possible. In terms of ported run levels, basically we've been porting dipoles that in the jargon are these matrix elements here. RPA response, both irreducible and reducible, self-energy, uh, both the exchange and the correlation, and uh, uh, BSC. I, I think that in this uh, concerning standard GW and BSC, there's really a few run levels that are not ported. Uh, probably the Coulomb cutoff is one, but usually takes no time. So let's say that for uh, coarse graining, uh, all GW and BSC calculation. So we have full support of NVIDIA GPUs concerning GW and BSC calculation. Of course, also independent particle RPA optics or, or, or everything that is uh, related. And work is in progress to support different uh, uh, backends. Here, I mean, other cards, uh, ideally AMD and uh, Intel cards. Important, and this is one of the key messages of this talk. Uh, out of this, we can demonstrate uh, demonstrate some important performance gain that can be obtained out of uh, uh, GPUs. In terms of performance, basically uh, it's important to uh, be able to perform well both at the MPI and OpenMP level and then also to perform well, well, well also including CUDA 
support. So here is what happens on a many core machine with this Marconi KNL uh, at the MPI level. So these are two graphs. Let's just look at the one of November nine, uh, 2019. That is the just the last update. Uh, this is a complete GW calculation for a 72 plus one atoms of TiO2. Here seconds is the whole time. So, and here you can see the distribution of, uh, uh, of the various uh, routines. So you see that self energy takes quite a lot of time, response function cannot, and dipole also takes some time because we have heavy elements with a lot of uh, uh, projectors and we can scale very well up to 10,000 MPI tasks. That is quite a lot. Also, this is times uh, two threads on this machine. You see that uh, uh, other um, well, uh, time waste is that the red part has basically been uh, strongly reduced. So this time over it uh, have basically been killed. Here is what happens. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention one very important thing here concerning MPI. For the sake of running on GPUs, it is extremely important that. Uh, all the memory, all the relevant memory is distributed that by increasing the number of MPIs, uh, that is also increasing the number of cards you have access to, you can distribute the memory and you don't have memory uh, bottlenecks. This is uh, almost achieved everyone throughout the, the code. So there are still uh, options uh, uh, working at the, with MPI distribution and MPI levels of parallelism to distribute uh, uh, memory. I'll try to sketch some examples later on. Here is what happens at the OpenMP level. Uh, I think here the limit, the physical limit of the number of course is uh, between eight and 12. So we are doing very well. We still gain also in the hyper threading region going from 12 uh, on. This is important because as I mentioned, we have one MPI, one card, meaning that uh, uh, the host uh, won't have, uh, uh, won't reach the maximum number of MPI tasks. And uh, so we exploit the uh, residual performance in the host by using uh, OpenMP. Again, there are little kernels that are left on the host. So uh, this is relevant, but not super important. All of this has been achieved uh, exploiting MPI plus OpenMP here is uh, for what concerns the linear response, a sketch of uh, how different levels of parallelism are handled in the input file. You see these variables here, Chi roles, Chi uh, CPU here is how to distribute uh, across different uh, levels. Importantly, the last one added is the parallelism over G vectors treated at the MPI level. So the response matrix is basically sliced over MPI uh, tasks G and this allows for memory uh, for reducing the memory footprint. Similar thing for the uh, correlation self energy. Uh, importantly here for instance uh, parallelizing over bands uh, is, is the option that mostly distributes uh, the uh, wave function memory. So that is also relevant uh, for what concerns uh, running on uh, GPUs. And okay, let's come to the actual performance uh, obtained on uh, uh, graphical cards. Here is uh, an example where we have used this system here. This uh, M7 graphene nano ribbon system. That also means that this is a stress test for the, uh, for the machines. This has been run on one node. So this is the performance within the node. And you see here, uh, compared to the complete usage of the node CPU only, we obtain these speed up factors here, eight times, four, eight, seven point five according to the machine. So we have a speed up factor from five to eight when uh, compared to the best usage of the uh, host CPU. That is quite uh, uh, remarkable, I'd say. Here is, uh, we go back to the system I used as an example at first, that is this TiO2, defective TiO2. And here is a, a porting on the Marconi, a run on the Marconi 100 machine. Here are the data. And if you compare with my previous slides, basically you see that the relative 
time spent in different parts of the code is very different. In particular, you see here dipoles uh, are basically dominating the time, while it, it was not before. And this is a kind of a sign of the fact that uh, we have a suboptimal exploitation of the GPUs. Then uh, once we have seen this, basically we have refactored the code. And after the refactoring, uh, here is uh, what we obtained now. The usage, uh, the relative usage is much uh, uh, more similar to what we saw before. And uh, if you compare, basically now, uh, if, if you look at the 20 uh, nodes here, basically we have in 350 seconds with a complete GW calculation for this system that is still quite large, so 73 atoms, 2,000 bands, 6 per cutoff for uh, Kai and so on, with 290 occupied uh, state. So timing pattern is similar to KNL, and uh, it, it's, uh, if we compare the ratio with respect to the, op, to the um, nominal uh, compute performance uh, of uh, Marconi 100 nodes and Marconi KNL nodes. Here we are going even beyond the uh, nominal ratio. The reason is that probably this uh, uh, refactoring we have done on the dipoles is uh, as an influence also on the CPU part. So so far I would say so good. And uh, here is instead a more massive. Uh, system. This is the case of a graphene nano ribbon on an extended uh, graphene sheet. Uh, here, this is a two dimensional system, so it's a two dimensional slab. Uh, so we have uh, K points uh, in plane. Uh, this is quite massive, uh, and uh, you can see though that uh, we were able to scale basically up to a thousand MPI tasks. That means 250 nodes or Marconi 100. And for those having a feeling, this is basically a single eight petaflop run with a parallel efficiency that is still larger than 50% uh, with respect to 16 nodes. And we were able to push this up to 600 nodes, basically two thirds of the, the whole machine and uh, uh, 2,400 cars with uh, exploiting a partition of the order of 20 petaflop. Just uh, for, for, for the sake of the records, uh, the whole Marconi KNL used to be 11 petaflops. So just to uh, give a feeling of, of the size of the computational partition we have access to with GPUs. Okay, so uh, here, just for the sake of uh, uh, future reference, uh, let me report how uh, one can compile Yambo with GPU support. Basically, as usual, you need to use the PGI compiler. This is a strict uh, requirement since we need CUDA Fortran that is implemented in full just by the PGI compiler that is also property of uh, NVIDIA. Now it's probably been released, rebranded as NB compiler, but it's the same thing. And you need to add this uh, one flag here, enable CUDA, where you provide the CUDA library, 10.1, compute capability, 70 stands for Volta cards, CC6 would be Pascal, and then I don't know what is the number for the forthcoming Ampere cards, and so on. And then, of course, you need both OpenMP and MPI. Here is an example of usage when running with GPUs. Let, let's consider these two nodes with 16 cores each, each node connected to two devices. So uh, basically, we have to start off from uh, um, one MPI, one card. So uh, two nodes, uh, we, overall we have four cards, so we need four MPIs. And then since we have two MPIs per node, we need eight threads at least, if we don't want to use hyper-threading, to exploit the residual performance on the node. So here uh, at the top, you, you, you see the, the comments you need to issue to run Yambo on such a configuration. Important here, I haven't specified these other options. Uh, one important option here is the binding of uh, MPIs and GPUs. Uh, this may not be uh, to be considered for granted. That is, uh, 
in some cases, if, if you don't do anything, it could well be that uh, the two MPIs you're putting on one node basically would send data to the same GPUs. Here, you, you either uh, interpose a script uh, or there could be uh, flags in the scheduler like Slurm to consider this. You, you, you need to basically check this with, with the sysadmin or on the docs of the machine you're running on. So this is just a warning to keep an eye on this. And with this, let me just conclude. The main point of this talk is, well, uh, many body perturbation theory need a lot of uh, uh, computational resources and these resources are going to come. So we are going to have these resources. And uh, uh, as I hope the data have shown, uh, have many body perturbation theory has the potential to exploit uh, this uh, uh, these machines also, and this is, uh, uh, let's say, the reason is mostly because many body perturbation theory exposes a lot of uh, computation. And besides that, uh, we have an hierarchy of methods, so we can add uh, uh, step by step uh, on the level of theory. We don't have uh, fancy functionals uh, to device. Uh, but uh, if we have more computation, basically we can somehow exploit higher levels of uh, theory. And the experience we made so far is basically very, very positive, I would say. There are issues and challenges. One is with programming models, especially for uh, legacy code and in view of maintainability. As I said, there is no unique and standard and open language to support these machines. Uh, and so, so far we need to stick to some vendor um, languages. Uh, hopefully this is gonna change. This is more an issue for developers rather than for users. Instead users I think has to be very careful about memory footprint of these, uh, of these methods and uh, need to be well aware of uh, how to control the memory especially by tuning MPI over different levels uh, of uh, uh, Parallelism, some software components are still missing and uh, uh, that are crucial, uh, like distributed linear algebra. We'll keep an eye on them and as soon as uh, they are going to be available, that is uh, basically highest priority to include in the uh, software distribution. And then one last uh, comment is about algorithmic affinity. I, I think not all the algorithms basically are uh, appealing to run on uh, on these machines, so to fit nicely on these machines. Luckily, many body perturbation theory is probably the best algorithm ever. Would be some uh, Monte Carlo like algorithm. Uh, still, many body perturbation theory thing has some high affinity, and uh, that is good news for us as developers and. Uh, users. And with this, let me thank uh, some of the people involved in the supporting whole uh, Yambo team to, uh, I mean, helping uh, uh, keeping together the, the code. And thank you for the attention. Thank you uh, very much, Andrea. Uh, there are some questions about this, uh, uh, about your talk. Uh, that uh, uh, I would like uh, to, to summarize, uh, let's say, to merge some of them. Uh, let's say all of, all of them deal with memory issues in, uh, in Yambo. Uh, there are particular questions on, uh, on uh, defect systems, but uh, uh, okay, let's try to be a bit broad. If you, Andrea, can give some advice, let's say, uh, we know that in the GPU, with this uh, very nice scaling you showed, we are memory bound uh, to the memory available in the card. Uh, anyway, also Yambo has different strategies of polarization that uh, um, allow memory distribution. If you can, Andrea, I think people is interested here uh, to give some tips. So when, yep. when, uh, what's the typical systems that you would run for sure on a GPU and which one you would uh, uh, go through a traditional CPU systems? And there, 
uh, what's the strategy you would apply to distribute memory? Okay, so the, hope you see my slide about uh, linear response. I think I would start from here. Uh, it's totally true what you said. Uh, and my experience is that the typical situation is that you start uh, with a given number of nodes to run your system and you get a memory uh, fail. And then you increase uh, this number of available nodes uh, until you start running and when you start running your calculation is super fast so the memory is really the the bottleneck and also uh, one of the most critical situation i've uh, met basically is when running on a system where the number of gpus i had access to was uh, uh, not tunable say if i have my own workstation with two gpus a system that doesn't fit because of memory there is basically stuck. You cannot do anything. If you instead run on a supercomputing system where you have a number of nodes equipped with GPUs, the typical strategy is that you increase the number of nodes such that via MPI you distribute memory farther in order to uh, basically keep memory under control and be able to run. Now, I'll make uh, an example. So for instance, system I showed you before, like defects, uh, 72 atoms with defect, 100 atoms with defect, those are all uh, uh, feasible. I would say the memory footprint, uh, especially at the beginning of a GW run comes uh, mostly from uh, uh, two aspects. Uh, one are uh, wave functions. Uh, and uh, uh, second one is the size of the response matrix. It is this kind of GG prime. This GG prime can be several thousands, uh, even tens of thousands. Now, in, uh, memory, uh, sorry, with functions, uh, as you see here at the bottom, can be distributed in the response function. You can distribute bo both uh, conduction and balance states. Uh, this is super good to use, uh, basically the, um, the distribution is quite even, so you do not, don't have load uh, imbalance uh, and it's very effective in terms of the memory. K-point distribution also would do, but uh, typically leads to uh, some redundancy in the wave function, so it's not as effective as distributing directly C and Vs. And uh, uh, last thing is, uh, you can use this G parallelism to slice out uh, the response function, the, yeah, the response function matrix, uh, and uh, distribute it. This comes at a price uh, of uh, as some overhead, since uh, like some FFTs are, are duplicated, but it's not too bad. Instead, what is uh, a bit more critical at the moment is that we are um, uh, forced to run. Uh, if you want to run on GPUs, the uh, linear algebra, we're will, will forced to run it uh, serially. So this Kynot GG prime matrix is not distributed. This is because we are missing this distributed linear algebra library on uh, GPUs. Uh, I think a solution would come in a, in a few months, nevertheless. Uh, here, if you're really bound to matrices that, I don't know, in, in my one of my recent uh, systems where I saw this problem, I had matrices of the order of 25,000 by 25,000. There, you're really borderline with the memory on the card. And in those cases, uh, there's a flag uh, such that you can do the linear algebra back uh, on the uh, host. So it's slower, but you're, you have to run it only from time to time. And uh, for the sake of memory, it may be uh, what is an option one may uh, consider. But usually, that is not the case. I think with these other tricks and the MPI level, you are well uh, within the um, uh, memory. And similarly, for the self energy here, key uh, aspect is basically parallelizing over the bands. Uh, basically, this will distribute with functions and uh, you can distribute all of them. If you use this QP parallelism, this tends to replicate some of the memory. Uh, so 
better just focus on bands and just use QP parallelism uh, if, you, if you can afford. Okay, uh, maybe we have time. We have many, many questions, but uh, uh, the time is uh, uh, practically over. Uh, yeah, one question that, uh, that arrived, maybe the last question to the others we will try to answer in the later uh, in the next days. Uh, um, there was a question about the Yambo implementation of the uh, GW screening. So if a plasma pole for frequency and uh, maybe Andrea, you can uh, answer to this also uh, giving some, uh, some comments about, uh, about the future. Okay, so yeah, Yambo at the moment has two implementations for treating the mm, dynamical dependence of uh, W and GW. One is the standard uh, God, God Be Needs, Plasma Pole, that has been the workhorse for uh, two decades of GW calculations. It's still, I, I think, very difficult to find systems where it totally fails, though it's not impossible. And indeed, there are a number of cases where uh, even God beneath, so plasma pole in general, but even God beneath, it seems to be quite stable, tend to fail. Uh, in, in those cases, uh, or for higher accuracy, you may want to run full frequency, GW. The um, version that is implemented in Yambo is a real axis, full frequencies. And uh, the number to keep in mind is that uh, plasma pole requires two evaluation of the response response uh, to frequencies. So the evaluation of the response function at two frequencies. Uh, uh, full frequency requires uh, hundreds of frequencies with all the memory, the connected memory uh, issues. Uh, so we, we are aware of this and uh, we are actually uh, working on a methodology that uh, is also already implemented in the um, development version that tends to reduce uh, um, these requirements, uh, so a full frequency quality uh, accuracy with the, at the price of uh, 10, 20 frequencies, uh, as if it were an analytic continuation approach, but uh, is not, uh, so without requiring the actual analytic continuation that is a known uh, uh, alternative methodology that is though uh, affected by accuracy issues exactly because uh, it's performed on the imaginary axis and then you need to go on the real axis. So basically we were able to work around this issue of the requirement for the analytic continuation while keeping pretty much the same cost of uh, uh, 10, 20 frequencies. That uh, stay tuned uh, next to come in a sense. Okay, and uh, thank you very much. And I think now we have to, to conclude. So I want uh, to thank uh, all uh, the speakers we had today for this uh, webinar. I want to thank also the technical support provided by Max to realize this, uh, this webinar. Uh, before concluding, uh, uh, just some recommendation. Uh, uh, there were questions asking about basic knowledge about how to start using Yambo. Uh, so in the, in the Max training page and also in the Yambo web page, you will find um, uh, training materials consisting of video lectures uh, that we recorded uh, of the, in the last school of Yambo in January. There are tutorials uh, that you can follow at your pace. Uh, so starting to make an uh, explained example step by step using Yambo. And uh, uh, for any question, Yambo has a forum, so you can subscribe to the forum and post there your problem, your questions, and we will try to answer as soon as possible, helping in the usage of the, of the code. Uh, finally, I recommend also to subscribe to the Max new newsletter, uh, so you can uh, receive uh, uh, updates, uh, updates, and uh, you will be updated on the next uh, Max activities. As uh, already said at the beginning, we have a webinar scheduled for the 24th of June on HPC libraries for the CP2K code and other codes. And uh, with this, uh, I just uh, thank you all the attendees uh, for having participated uh, to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much.